Alec Johnson, a very, very warm welcome to Ten Q Interview. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, weirdly, I came across your YouTube channel when researching, <clears throat> trying to make this podcast better. And as soon as I saw Take One Tech, I was like, do you know what? I want to get this guy on because A, you seem to know what you're talking about and B, your setup is is very, very cool. So I wanted to say thank you and welcome. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks so much for the kind words and thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Good. Take One Tech. Tell me about the, the origin story. How did it get started? Why YouTube? Uh, so it was uh, two two years ago, May 2021. And that, I was... Really? Uh, that, that, that short time ago? Yeah, yeah. And it was wow, really... Okay. It, it came out of, I was creating course content for a, an, another business, not Take One Tech, but another, another business. And right. I was really my own worst enemy when it came to recording the content because... Uh, I would I would do it the the usual way, you know, record the videos, yeah. take them into an editor, go and do the editing, and I, I was I was just literally my own worst enemy because if I knew that I could retake something, then I would be endlessly, you know, taking it. Something was never quite right, and uh, you know, I call myself a recovering perfectionist uh, because that perfectionism can be something that really is limiting if it stops you from shipping. If you're always yeah. there trying to get that, you know, the the, the perfect take or whatever, um, and then because I was doing multiple takes. When I would take the uh, the content into the video editor, um, then it was a case of you know sometimes I didn't actually have a perfect take for one part, and I was having to go back and re-record stuff and and all this kind of stuff. And it was taking me you know to make a thirty minute video. It could be you know uh, days or weeks yeah, <laughs> to actually you. make it. I know. I hear you. I hear you. So I figured there must be a way to just actually do everything in one take because, you know, I'm fine if I'm doing public speaking on a stage in front of, you know, hundreds of people. I've got no problem delivering the content. And basically all that I'm doing in my courses and on the YouTube channel is just delivering some form of content, be it, you know, a tutorial, a review or a presentation or something. So I thought, well, yeah. if I just sit down with, a, you know, a friend or, or a colleague or somebody in an audience, I've got no issue with actually talking about this stuff and delivering it in a natural way. So why is it that then when I come to do the editing that, you know, I have this issue? So I thought, well, I need to just be able to find a way to do it in one take. Um, and that's where the name comes from. So all the videos on my channel uh, <laughs> are just done in one take with no edits. Um, and the software that I found to do that with was a program called Ecamm Live. Uh, and yeah. what that allows you to do is basically just set up uh, different scenes, different views, if you like, in, your, uh, in, the, in the software. Um, and then you can switch between them like on the fly as you're actually delivering the content. So for my tutorials, I'll have different scenes, which is, you know, one me face on, one with yeah. the, the screen where I'm showing something on the screen. And then I'm just switching back and forth between them on the, uh, on the stream deck to switch between those different scenes. Um, yeah. And the YouTube channel was actually set up as a test bed, if you like, for this process of creating videos in one take for me to, to then go and do that in my, uh, in my, my course material. And I set oh, okay. out when I started the channel to do 100 videos in 100 days. So I was just basically getting up and every morning I'd just do a video and, and put them out just to get the reps in. Uh, I then extended that to, to a year to try and do 365 in a year. Uh, I fell a little bit short of that. I think I did 320 or something. Um, but that, that's where the origin came from, just practicing basically the process of creating videos for courses unrelated to Take One Tech. And then it's kind okay. of grown from there, essentially. <laughs> You, you're, you're a man after my own heart with the whole 100 reps. So did, you, did you do 100 in 100 days? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess for those listening or watching who are thinking about starting a YouTube channel, I mean, we will come back to the rest of it, but do you think that 100 in 100 days is, is kind of beneficial? Yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. Not necessarily 100 days because, you know, people have got different, you know, limitations on their time <laughs> and everything. But um, for me, forcing myself to do that because um, I, I was only had a, you know, a certain finite amount of time, time every day. Yep. So it's basically two hours every morning. I tend to get up early anyway, so I get up at like three o'clock. Um, so four till six was my time to just decide what I was going to make, make the video. The videos are generally like 30 minutes and then do yeah. all of the other uploading and ongoing management of the channel in that time. So that's Were you working full time at this point? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So, um, so it was just okay. literally squeezed into that little uh, that little window. <laughs> so that's not necessarily for everybody, you know, to be able yeah. to do that. I get that everyone's got different time constraints. But one of the things about it is, I think people get too hung up on like analytics and views and all of this kind of stuff when they really yeah, haven't yeah. got the, the the sort of body of work there to to really judge it on a you know with a big enough pool of data basically so that was yeah, the other okay. reason for doing the 100 was just to get that under my belt before i tried to change anything either and so i didn't really mm -hmm. tweak anything about my process or my system or 
you know, the content or anything within that time, or even actually probably more like 200 videos, I would guess, uh, was the uh, before I started changing anything up. That's really impressive. I'm really impressed. I, I like that. I did the same thing with my podcast, and I said to myself, <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to do a year, and I'm not even going to think about it. I'm not going to look at the numbers. I don't care. It's just about doing it and refining the process and actually mm -hmm. trying to get it to a point where it's because I've done it before. I've done projects before where you get hung up on the numbers and, you know, you get three downloads and you're like, oh, God, what's the point? Yeah. But you never get any growth until you get past that stuff and you learn that stuff and you <clears throat> and you decide what's good and what's bad and, and the rest of it. So I, I really like that methodology. When did it turn from that kind of the that sort of approach to, to what we see now with the, with the tech stuff? Uh, well, so that was, it was all still on the same theme. You know, my, my content's all oh, been exactly, okay. the, it's all been exactly the same uh, content. So in fact, the majority of my videos, I think I've got like, I don't know, 450 or something. And most of those were in the first year. Um, I haven't actually been as consistent since then. So I do a weekly live stream now and I put out like occasional other videos. But yeah, um, yeah mo most of my content is actually from that time. So, you know, the majority of the stream deck videos and all of that are those, uh, those first videos. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you when you finished that hunt you went from the hundred and then tried to do the three six five yeah did you did so i've done thing challenges before where it's got that mm -hmm. time factor yeah <clears throat> and and sometimes when i finished whatever it is it could be 30 days it could be 100 days it could be a week whatever it doesn't matter i i have this weird thing in my head where i'm like oh it's done now and i and i take my foot off the gas like right. whatever it might be did, did you experience any of that um, I, I don't think I did actually with the 100 because I'd already planned to be just like when I got to about 80, I kind of thought, well, I could just carry on. I mean, it's, I'm, there's, there's, it, I got into the point there where it was such a routine that, yeah. it, you know, it just became a routine then. Um, the reason for kind of missing, I guess, the, the 365 is that uh, I had another business that I'm involved in. I had some issues with that that then, you know, were taking a lot of my time and I, would ju I yeah. just didn't basically have the time for it. And that is probably where or that is actually where I kind of got out of the flow a little bit. Um, and so, um, yeah, then it's just a, bit, a case of being more of an evolution of looking at ways to um, uh, to sort of monetize off platform, really. Uh, not that okay. I was monetized at that point, but it, it took me from May the 15th up until the end of the year. It was literally like quarter to midnight on the New Year's Eve on the 20, uh, uh, 2021 that I got monetized um, on on YouTube. But in that time, I'd already made more on, you know, off off YouTube through Take One Tech from people booking consultations, like selling yeah. icon packs for Stream Deck and things like that. Um, then I've made since getting monetized on YouTube. So, uh, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to wait to be monetized to actually monetize a channel. Um, oh, yeah. And then at the same time that um, I was kind of a approaching that, um, that 365 is also when I started looking at creating actual courses off YouTube as well that are all under the kind of Take One Tech brand. Um, and that came about because one of the things that I was covering a lot on my channel was Ecamm Live. Um, and that is under such rapid development and they're constantly adding in new features that, you know, a lot of my videos go out of date. They're technically, you know, not accurate yeah. because there are now better ways to do things. And um, I tried to combat that at one point. Um, well, actually, actually, it's it's this thing of when you go to the, the University of YouTube, you never quite know if you've got all of the information. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want yeah, to find yeah, out yeah. about Stream Deck, but have you missed something because you've seen somebody make a cool video about this or that, but do you know yeah. everything they can do? Um, so at one point I did make my longest video on YouTube was a four and a half hour one take video, which was of um, how four to and use... a half hours in one take. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I... But that was that was about how to how to use Ecamm Live from start to finish, because um, I thought that there yeah. were going to be some people who actually just want to know, like, right, well, tell me everything like as a one big tutorial from start to finish that they can go and watch. But then I fell, fell into the, the trap of, well, now I've got loads of different parts of that that are out of date because they updated it. So that's when I started looking at creating courses to sort of complement the stuff I was doing on the channel, but where it had organization. And somebody said, you know, information is free, but people pay for organization. And yeah. so there's not really much that I'm saying in my courses that I'm not saying on the, the various videos that I've made, except that the course is just packaged up in a, you know, taking people on a, uh, you know, a story arc or whatever you want to call it through this yeah. uh, process. And then I, it also I, gives I've me heard the option. i before, actually, about lots of different... Um course topics and it's the same thing like, i mean you can go and find whatever you want on youtube these days yeah right? and it's um 
it's like you said, it's just finding that package that gets you from A to B and, uh -huh. and the whole way along. And, and the, other, the other thing about it is being able to update the content as well so that it becomes people's encyclopedia for Stream Deck, for Roadcaster, for Ecamm, for whatever the course is on, so that they yeah. know that they've always got that to refer to. So if there's any updates, they can always think, right, well, I'll just go and find out the bits that are new. And I've still got that to refer to as a, an ongoing, evolving uh, yeah, 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 resource, yeah. basically. I'm very curious about the take, uh, the one take strategy. Mm-hmm. Because that is quite a skill, right? I mean, even, I guess, professionals, professional performers who have been trained in, in this kind of stuff find that challenging. I guess, I, I guess what I'm trying to work out is why did you go down that route and how have you kind of <clears throat> got better at it? Because if you can do that well, and I didn't really realize that until you said it, it kind of makes a bit of sense. But I've watched a few of your videos. I've watched a lot of your videos. And... I had twig that you hadn't edited it. Which right. is it's funny. I do get comments sometimes. I, <laughs> I do get comments sometimes saying your edits are seamless. <laughs> I'm like, <"All> right. <laughs> so, yeah. so, are the, so are the ums and ers in there. But to be honest, this is coming back as well to the perfectionism thing in me, that it was another way for me to kind of try and break free from that perfectionist in me. Mm. Um, because I think that we, you know, the, the things that I was retaking might have been me just like slightly misspeaking. And you'll see yeah. in my videos that I often misspeak and say, oh, no, it's not over here, it's over there, or, you know, some little thing like that. But I always yeah. just approach it that I'm, I'm just sitting down speaking to a, you know, a, a friend or um, I seem to be a lot of people's <laughs> go-to tech guy. So I don't <laughs> normally sit down with them and, you know, talking them yeah, through something and then halfway through minutes. and say, whoa, 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 we just got to start over again. So I, I, that's you know, the way that I treat the videos is just like that, as if I'm just speaking to a, a friend. Do you know, I had the exact same conversation. I, had, I have someone who edits some of my podcast stuff and she was cutting out every um and ah and pause yep. and it got to the point where it was driving me crazy because you look at the video and it'd just be like jumping from side to side, you know, up and down, yes. arms moving and all sorts. Uh -huh. And I said to her, I, was like, I said, don't do it. And she's like, yeah, but, you know, in YouTube, you've got to be like seamless. You've got to be, um, it's all about retention. I was like, but it's not real. It's not how people chat mm -hmm. like it's exactly to your point you don't sort of chat to someone and then go hang on a second let me just retake that like it doesn't work yeah. so it's kind of nice to see that actually that's, that's your approach in this youtube perfection world of, uh, yeah i think that there's a there's a, uh, a thing there about you know people doing all these things like jump cuts and all that in edits where basically it's just essentially yeah. not giving people time almost to to switch off or anything like that and they're really <laughs> yeah. tight the fact is that that is probably the way to get the maximum number of views. Um, yes. So, I, I, and it, I, I kind of liken it to um, uh, sales funnels as well, where there are there are certain <laughs> techniques you can do to absolutely maximize the return on your investment on you know adverts and things like that. Um, yeah. But actually, some of these techniques really don't sit well with a certain group of people. And so, for me, I, I just prefer to make something that is more natural. I know that I could probably get more views, but I'm not after views. I'm after a real connection with people. Um, because I don't take the the overall number of views as being the thing. I take it as being the number of people I've I've helped and I've had that connection with. And so if that leads, if they have a feeling that they can relate to me a lot more, and then there's more people booking calls with me, maybe, um, or yeah. you know, coming into to my other training and stuff like that, um, and then that I can have a literally a real connection. That means far more to me than having you know x num number more um, subscribers, viewers, or, or all of that kind of stuff. So. I guess, I guess it's a different type of content, isn't it? Like you're mm -hmm. not trying to do the Mr. Beast yes, yep. hype train, right? And, you, yeah. and you're you're trying to teach people and people know they are coming to you because they want to be taught. If you don't want to be taught, then they won't watch your stuff anyway, mm -hmm. <clears throat> whether yeah. or not you're editing it slickly or not. So yeah, yeah, I, th I think there's there's it's weird how we're quite aligned on that. I think that the whole real life conversation mm -hmm. It's kind of a good thing in YouTube. I think it's keeps it a bit more realistic. Yeah, and even the things that I watch that um, that aren't necessarily you know tutorial. I mean, I do a lot of I studying on YouTube stuff that I want to learn. But the things that I watch yeah. for kind of more like relaxation, um, they have the very similar style to mine, really, in terms of you know it is more conversational and there's no like hyper edits. I find those things that are really edited to within an inch of their life. I find that really fatiguing to watch. It's almost like too quick for me. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm getting older. I don't know, but <laughs> so. well, not just that, but I guess from a from a creator perspective, that takes your workflow, and I guess we'll talk about that in a bit. But 
but that takes your workflow from here yep. to whew, like three well, X in, right? Four X in. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. that's a huge point. I mean, is it better to put out, um, you know, 100 videos with no edits that, you know, I've just been able to make in two hours or basically yeah. get one 30 minute video out that's perfect. Um, and it's just about, you know, get, not holding back the information, really. And so that was that mm. was definitely another part of it for me is just not having to go, having to have all of those extra steps to uh, to work through. Yeah, well, funny enough, that's kind of um, why I'm really interested in Ecamm Live for my podcast, because uh -huh. I want to do more. And but if you if you start having hour and a half, hour two hour conversations with people, mm -hmm. the edit process after that is a pain. And I'm yeah. not even talking about like full on, you know, cutting out ums and ahs. I'm just like <coughs> checking that the audio is okay, checking that yeah, you know, I might want to clip a bit out or something. Uh -huh. And it just takes forever. Yeah. So I, I'm I the reason I went down, I came across your content because I was looking at Ecamm Live, I was looking at the Elgato Stream Deck mm -hmm. and I want to sort of get to that point where I'm recording it as I speak it. Yes. And, and so obviously when I'm speaking, I will be on me. And then when you're speaking, I press a button on the stream deck and then it goes to you. Mm -hmm. and, and I figure it might be a little bit fiddly to begin with, but I think once I get the hang of it, then that ultimately just gets my, um, my workflow process down to re yeah. you know, real time. Uh -huh. And it saves me so much time. And it really, Honestly, you, know, you so. could you you would be set up and it would become second nature within, you know, hardly any time at all. It's not yeah. something that takes ages to sort of get into, um, and especially with something you know like maybe even having a a scene in ecam that was you know both people on screen, maybe one yep. that was just you, one that was the yep. guest, um, and then you just got three buttons and a record button. You could be flicking between those like in yeah. no trouble. Um, and the and stream it records deck, it like, and it records it as you as you do it, right? So then you haven't got theoretically you got you've not got to go and edit it. It records it as you're doing it, and then also yeah. you can get the the final recording out. You can also do ISO video recording, isolated video. So you could then have like uh, the the full recording plus yeah. your guest coming in on interview mode in Ecamm plus your own camera yeah. uh, plus your individual audio tracks for each person as well. If you did want to go and you know post pro uh, produce that for just the you know maybe improve the audio quality or something. Or if, if you had yeah. any audio issues to do something with that, uh, you can get that as well. So, uh, yeah, you've basically got, you know, multiple different audio tracks, uh, uh, multiple different yeah. files, I should say, for audio and, and video. I think I need to just commit and like, set aside a day to play with it and just get it. Because you're right, once you start doing it, it will become mm -hmm. just normal, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and the Stream Deck is really kind of um, is the thing that makes it as well. Uh, just to be able to have those those buttons, uh, and yeah. and especially if you're then using that to, you know, for other for other areas of business. Because one one of the things about ecam, without going down an ecam rabbit hole, is <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is why on my uh, channel there's so many ecam videos. It's just because I'm like I, I'm a super fan basically because it's just enabled yeah. so many things for me. Um, and I didn't intend to make the channel about Stream Deck and um, uh, and ecam. It was that I was making it about the tech tools that I use on my computer. So I was going to do the, you know, more about sort of productivity apps and utilities and things like that. But then yeah. when I got these devices that were for making the content, I was just like absolutely in love with them. And so that's then became like, you know, a major passion and why I was making it. But, but one of the things that about Ecamm is all of the stuff that you can do for, for recorded video and for live streaming, you can also take it into platforms like Zoom and Teams so that yeah. you've got that same production quality. And then the Stream Deck is kind of like the glue that holds it all together to be able to control your zoom meeting your presentation and ecamm and, and everything it's and you it's know what that's, that's how that's how i found out about it and what's what's strange is i consider myself pretty tech savvy I, you know I, i'm up to date on a lot of things but mm -hmm. i'd never heard of it right I, mean, I, I was on a, i was on a call with somebody and they had um they had this uh like scene as i now know they're called but it was set oh. up it almost looked like sky sports you know with right. the whole kind of with the graphics and what have you yeah I was just like, oh my god, that's really cool. And then, so then I went down this um, ecam live rabbit hole, and I still at this point I didn't know what it was called. Mm -hmm. And and I was chatting to some uh, another friend of mine. I was like, oh, you know, I've got I've got to get my workflow on this podcast to be quicker because I want to put out more content, but I haven't got the hours to be like editing every one right. and, and and the rest of it. And and I was outsourcing my editing, but that that's coming to an end soon. So that this this realization that i needed to do something quickly it was like oh my mm -hmm. god 
And he's like, oh, yeah, no, you should try Ecamm Live. It's really cool. It might solve your problem. <laughs> so I wanted more cameras as well. This was the other thing. I was like, yep. when when me and you chat now, I've got one camera here and you've got one camera on you. Yep. Like if, if we were on TV, and I know it's a bit of a crude analogy, I guess, but if you were on TV, there'd be a camera over here, camera mm-hmm. over there. And, and you get that almost without trying to go down the retention rabbit hole of when people are watching, they mm-hmm. might just get a bit bored if it's just your head, just my head, just, yes, you know. Yep. So, you, <coughs> excuse me, you can mix in a little bit of, you know, different camera here mm-hmm. different cam- you know, and what have you. And I said to him, I was like, oh, how could I, This that was my problem. I was like, how can I solve this? Because I oh, should check out Ecamm Live. You could probably do that with a Stream Deck. Yeah. I was like, what? I was like, okay. Which is then how we came about uh, falling down your channel. Right. <laughs> Let's talk about, so, how how do you come up with ideas for, for videos? Um, I've just got like a long running list and it's all about like the different tools I use. So I've, I've mentioned I've covered a lot of Ecamm stuff. So then it's, you know, certain features. There's just a whole list of features in that. And it's, yeah. it's kind of it's kind of easy for me, really, when I'm doing what I'm doing, where I'm covering software and, uh, you know, Stream Deck and these different tools or, you know, the roadcasters and things like that. Um, that they've all got a set of features. And so every feature is technically a video, isn't it? You know, it's, it's quite, yeah. it's not, it's not hard to sort of find that. Um, and then there's obviously, you know, stuff that is, um, you know, specific to me and my workflows that, you know, I share stuff about that. Um, and right. it, it also comes from questions from, you know, people who have commented in videos or like in the Ecamm Live community, if you're covering a particular okay. topic and you're in a community that is that topic, then there's no end of, of things there. So, Probably about half of the Ecamm videos that I've done as well have been a direct result of being in the Ecamm Live Facebook group. And then, you know, somebody <laughs> okay. asks a question in there. So I'll just be like, oh, I'll just make a video about it. And then so, uh, so I've made a video that's a direct, you know, answer to, to that kind of stuff. Um, so, so for me, the, it's, the it's ideas funny, are... Is, sorry, I was just going to say, it's funny how these products, like, if you go back 10 years, you'd get an instruction manual or a PDF mm-hmm. or something, and, and you basically have to find it. Now, these companies must love it now that there's people like you uh-huh. This isn't just for soft, like all software or all even physical products, anything. There's always someone who's going to be going, this is how you get the best out of. I, I've got these, um, I can't, I'll put them on some of these DJI mics. Oh, yes. You know, the yeah, little, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, right, okay, how do I work this? Google, I put it in YouTube and there's a thousand videos of everyone going, right, these are the right <laughs> settings. These are, it's, yeah. It's, do you have any do ecam do you talk to the guys there that about- yeah, yeah um um so i'm i became a moderator in the ecam live facebook group and then i you know ecam live by the way uh you would be forgiven for thinking you know it's a massive company that's made this amazing software uh, it's only two guys it's ken and glenn <laughs> the uh, the twins no, it's not. and uh the actual whole company i think in total they've got five employees including ken and glenn or six or seven maybe uh, but it's a tiny it's really a tiny company Wowzers. but just with a massive user base um the the ecamm live facebook group's got just over 20,000 uh, people in it um but then uh, yeah their user base is is you know larger than that um but they're just really responsive to what people want and they're listening and because they are you know although you know a large user base and it's a great mm. application uh, they're really you know agile in terms of what they can do they don't have to pass anything up through you know <laughs> <laughs> development chains or anything like that you know yeah. somebody will literally just drop a feature request into the facebook group and then ken or glenn will just go hmm, that's a good idea and you know they'll go and implement it and and it's it's really adapted and i think that's why um the facebook community for ecamm is so strong is just because everybody first of all has got this feeling of ecamm live has just sort of enabled something for them that they weren't able to do before and that's the mm. you know that's why i just go crazy over it is because it's just it's allowed me to do so much that i was just wasn't able to do before i wouldn't have put out all of the content i've done without that but then also you know what i'm able to do now in online meetings and virtual presentations and have those all run just seamlessly like a well-oiled yeah. machine as opposed to fumbling around trying to find the screen share button in zoom and sharing the wrong window <laughs> and all the things that just disrupt it so it's actually enabled so much more for me than just the you know, the, the, the YouTube channel, but everybody yeah. in the Ecamm community is like that as well. Once you start using it, people are just like, this is amazing. <laughs> and so we've all got that feeling, I think, in the community of just everyone's just like, you know, full of joy over it. And so it's a really nice community. You go in some other communities for like other uh, products or services or software, and sometimes yeah. it could be like bitchiness and stuff like that, but there's just none of it in there. It's, 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 it's kind of, you have to pinch yourself to think that you're not, that you're in a, in, in a, in a community that's about an app. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. 
Um, so is, is that Facebook group somewhere you'd recommend for the likes of myself and, oh, and for others? Sure. I mean, obviously I will link to your channel so people can, yeah, yeah, can for sure. Your ECAB stuff, but yeah, is that a good place as well? Definitely. Yeah. Facebook.com okay. slash group slash ecam live. But, <laughs> okay. um, so yeah, I'm, a, I mean, I'm, a, I'm associated with them in that I am, uh, um, like one of the moderators in the Facebook group and then I've done some stuff on their channel. So I've done a whole ecam live advanced video series for them on their channel. Um, right. But um, yeah, and then there's like there's there's some other brands like Rode recently sent me all of their new Rode products and coming back I can to see, your... I can see your fancy Rode black mic there. I like, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. But but coming back to your point about you know uh, companies liking it when you know you got all these creators doing it, there is another aspect to that which is um, you know every single product that uh, be it Rode, Shaw, uh, Elgato or anything like that, any every product that they've made, uh, they've made their own videos about it. But people want yeah. to go and find, you know, what other people are saying about it, not what the yeah. company is saying. So it's actually, you know, more so in their benefit to be, you know, giving the stuff to other people and allowing them to make the content because then people are getting more of an impartial uh, view about things. Um, yeah, and th there was a similar thing with Amazon. So I'm also on the Amazon Influencer Program. So I make content on Amazon and I do live streams on Amazon as well. Um, and in that, you're basically, if you do a live stream, you have a little carousel at the bottom of your screen and you decide what products you want to put in there. And so then as you're live streaming, if people click on the product to buy it, then you get the affiliate commission from, from oh, that. Yeah, okay. um, it's only in uh, US at the moment. But actually, when that um, scheme started, what Amazon did was they went out to all of these, you know, big, massive influencers to get them to come on the channel to go and do, you know, promote products. Uh, yeah. But it just fell flat because people didn't actually want to hear from, you know, <laughs> millionaires and people like that with multiple things. They wanted it's all to a bit hear fake, from real... isn't it, when it gets to that level? Exactly, yeah. And they wanted yeah. to hear from like real people with, you know, real opinions and real experiences. Um, and the people who go on there and try and do really, really overly produced uh, videos also don't tend to do as well as the people who are literally just on camera, maybe even on a mobile, just saying, oh, yeah, yeah. I've got this thing here and it does this and that and it's, it's, <laughs> it's good and you might like it for this. Yeah. It's, it's that kind of like really down-to-earth type approach that people appreciate on, uh, on Amazon. And that's kind of linked to the same thing, really. You know, companies, uh, yeah. companies appreciating that independent creators creating content about their products. No, they do. I will, we'll come back to the whole... I, I think that would be good part of question four for us to explore. But I, I'm going to ask you about systems and processes. And I can obviously you've spoken about Ecamm Live and the Stream Deck, mm -hmm. which is a big rabbit hole. And I and I will encourage my viewers and listeners to go and check out your stuff because, like you said, and I said, this is about you and you know your channel. And I don't want it to necessarily become a a Stream Deck kind of promo <laughs> thing. But is there anything else you use or incorporate into getting your videos out there that maybe people would benefit from hearing about i mean it might even be do you, do you get help you know on a personnel level i don't know no i don't get out with anything i just do it uh do it all but yeah trying to look for ways to automate and streamline things is uh is you know a big part of my passion you know that's kind yeah. of what the channel was originally supposed to be about it was more about those uh utilities that i use on my mac to sort of streamline the process and and, and speed things up there's one in particular uh, which is called Keyboard Maestro, which is an app for the the Mac that I use. And I use that for all kinds of automation things. Basically, anything that you could physically do on your Mac, you could program Keyboard Maestro to do for you. Um, and okay. so anything that you're doing that is repetitive tasks, it can do. So, And it can be as simple as, um, you know, maybe clicking on a menu in, a, in, a, in an application that doesn't normally have a, a keyboard shortcut associated with it. And so then you could program that as a Stream Deck button to link with Keyboard Maestro to go and do that. So then any application that you want to have a full suite of controls for, you could have that, you could use it to program those. Um, What's the difference between that and Stream Deck? Uh, sorry, uh, Stream Deck's the, the hardware, whereas Keyboard Maestro is just an app that sits on your computer um, yeah. and that, that does stuff. But you can you can set a load of different uh, triggers, basically. So it's, it's basically something that has got a trigger, and then it's going to perform an action or a sequence of actions. So right. the trigger might be pressing a button on your Stream Deck, but the trigger might also be um, you know, it's midnight, therefore, what you're going to do is start a backup or do something like that. You know, it's, it's yeah. any kind of automation. Um, but you can okay. also get it to do things like, um, you know, open a browser, open a website, and you can have a whole chain of things. Then you can get it to search for a particular image on the screen and simulate clicking on that image. So imagine but this, like, would, this is on your keyboard, though, right? 
it, it's it, it's not actually keyboard maestro is a, is an app that's the name of the app but it's it's all right. done in in software um yeah. so I'll, I'll give you an example of one so i've got a button on my stream deck when i've finished my recording of a video uh yes. i'll go and rename the 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 video file to what i want to to call it but then I'll press one button on my Stream Deck. Now, what that does is that triggers one of these little macros that's running in Keyboard Maestro. And what yeah. it does is it opens up uh, uh, YouTube Studio in the browser. It then moves the mouse to go and click on the Upload button. Um, and then okay. when the Upload button is clicked, uh, there's an option that says, do you want to upload a video? Do you want to schedule a live stream or a post or whatever it is? It yeah. then clicks on the bit to upload a video. Um, then that will bring up the dialog box to show the uh, the list of uh, files that I've got in my you know the the in my finder. Um, so it searches for the bottommost one with the .mp4 uh, end on the the file name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To basically click on that to upload the last file that I've uh, created. Um, then it oh opens God, up you, all of my this, different you, apps. What you're saying, this could this could revolutionise how I publish my podcast. Yeah, ba basically, what it does is with one button, everything is just done. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it uploads the video, it opens up my uh, thumbnail. Uh, I use Photoshop to edit my thumbnails, so it opens up that. It opens up some notes where I type out some timestamps and things like that. Um, so it's it, keyboard maestro is is for automation and anything that you do on a repetitive basis. Um, like either a very short thing or a very long thing, you can just program it to do all those things. In how many, a, in, how many in actions could you put into that? Infinite, infinite. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my days. Yeah. This, po this podcast might have just paid for itself in one, <laughs> one, one recording. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's just um, there's, there's literally really kind of nothing that you do on, the, on your computer that you couldn't actually have that done what takes the time sometimes is the thought process behind it. So yeah. like when I was saying, right, well, I'd love to be able to just press a button and it just upload everything for me to YouTube. So all it was a case of doing was going through those steps myself and say, well, what do I do? I open Google Chrome or whatever it is. I yeah. go to this URL, then I go and click the button. And so I just then programmed it to go and do all of those, uh, those different things step by you, step in sequence. Um, but once you you've have done a video that, on your, on your channel about this, I do have a yeah yeah keyboard maestro okay. is is the thing so <laughs> right yeah. I am gonna watch that straight after speaking to you and I'll also <laughs> link to it below in the show notes because that sounds pretty pretty incredible yeah it's 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 um and and the thing about that is that has a uh, you, with with Stream Deck you can then have a plugin to go into keyboard maestro to then uh, you know you're basically controlling these things by just pressing a button on your Stream Deck that's that's kind of the thing about it um and and that's oh. why Stream Deck becomes like this hub in amongst absolutely everything else it's kind of like the i, I just couldn't live without it frankly <laughs> now if somebody took my stream deck away from me do you know what alec it's just a case of you don't know what you don't know yeah and there'll be people like myself like when i when i publish my podcast i'll go to youtube and i'll upload the video and then i'll do all the you know the thumbnail the description mm -hmm. i will also go to um my podcast host captivate and upload mm -hmm. podcast and then fill in this picture yep. you know this this is I'll then also go to WordPress where I host my um, uh, my site, and I'll and I'll do the same there. And every every Monday, that's my job, like it, because obviously I put the podcast out every Tuesday morning. So every Monday, I'll set aside a couple of hours to go right. This is what I need to do to get it all yeah. scheduled for the next morning. But it's just a it's a very um, laborious task sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that's what keyboard maestro is great for. Every laborious task, and I and. I think that some people look at it when they first uh, when they first try it, and that yeah. one of two things will happen: either they'll look at it and think this is way too complicated because it can do yeah. all of these different things, and then they'll just switch off. Uh, the other yeah. mistake that I fell into when I I've been using it for about fifteen years now, but when I first started it, the mistake that I made was, "Oh my god, this is amazing! Let me think of all of the things that I can have it do, <laughs> and yeah. then take like two months out of my life to go and program them all." And then let yeah. me just promptly like forget what all of the shortcuts were because then I didn't have there weren't stream decks then so it was all yeah. keyboard shortcuts so then it re relied on me uh, and that's why it's called keyboard maestro because it's kind of like you're playing your keyboard uh, your yeah. your computer keyboard um, so then I, then you have to I, it was a case of remembering all of these keyboard shortcuts for like the hundreds of macros I'd set up and I couldn't remember any of them so then it was a case yeah. of when I wanted to do something I was having to refer to a list which kind of defeats the point, yeah, <laughs> point yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the approach to take with it is to understand what it can do in terms of it can probably do anything that you you yeah. are doing repetitively uh, and then just slowly as you notice something that you're doing um repetitively think right okay then 
this time I'm going to take some time out to try and program that one and get that into your workflow and then you'll find another one and, and just sort of build it up over over time. Do you know what's funny is I, I thought I was pretty slick because I had all the um, the Safari tabs for my podcast in a, in a bookmark folder. Yeah. And then when you click on it, it goes open in new tabs. It just opens all of them. Opens them all up. Yeah, yeah. Like that was my level of automation. I thought that's, that's <laughs> slick because it just means I haven't <clears throat> got to go and open every one again. Yeah. But you've just blown my mind a little bit. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. It's, uh, the more people that know about Keyboard Maestro, the better. <laughs> and the other thing about it is it's like, a, I, I think it's, I want to say it's like, I don't know, $30, $50, $40, whatever it is, but it's just like a one-time thing. It's not another subscription to add to the endless really? train of subscriptions. What oh it can God. do for like the amount of time that it can save you is just mind boggling. And it's kind of this little app that's been around for years and years and years. And um and well, that's the funny thing alec right everyone will talk about ai and how ai can do this that and the other yeah and you've just shared a, an app that costs whatever that i mean that's nothing in the grand scheme of things right <laughs> yes yeah the amount of time it can save you yeah it, it'll pay for itself in you know very little time whatsoever <laughs> yeah what um, i'm gonna ask you one question and i do remember seeing something on your video so i i bought a teleprompter off the back yep. of um your desk tour actually right. because i had this big thing with my podcast where i wasn't making eye contact with someone yes like my camera would be up there and then i'd be like this and it just, mm-hmm. it just looked a bit rubbish and i saw yours and i thought oh my god that's so cool and and then I, I watched your tour of your office right and you had you had the teleprompter so yep. i went and bought one and it is good how do i get my ipad which is just here yep to be um I guess the right way around it's all mirrored at the moment uh yeah there is um there's a thing called lunar display which plugs into the ipad as like a little dongle and then that plugs into your computer and so instead of using it if you're just using it in sidecar which is the mode that you can basically share you know it becomes an extended desk desk then okay. um then lunar display does it that's like a little dongle and you can flip the image in there uh, there's another app called uh, duet display which is an ipad app and then you have the same app on your computer as well um, and yep. that one, you're then basically running Duet Display on the on the iPad, and then that one I think can do the flipping thing. Uh, what yes, I've used I've... is a, I've used a, a field monitor, so it's a kind of a, a field monitor for a camera. So a monitor that typically you would have for monitoring what's going on on your camera or video camera that plugs in over HDMI from your camera typically. Um, but I've just plugged that into the computer, so it then just becomes another HDMI display. Uh, and apart from being a really high quality display, um, and also not tying up my iPad. Um, it, you can also flip the display in that as well. So that's what, that's what the okay. way that I went. I got a dedicated display for it. And then it means okay. that it's just always on. It's just always a part of my desktop. Um, yeah. And I, I find myself kind of using it even when I'm just working, not speaking to anybody. It's, it's kind of just like an extra an extra desktop then, really, an extra desktop. Well, this is space. it. now. So now I've got a monitor here and I've got a monitor there. Right. And then I've got this big teleprompter thing that sits in the middle with my iPad on it, which... <clears throat> excuse me you know 99 percent of the time is just turned off right except right. when the notifications keep popping up and distracting me but uh-huh. okay hdmi monitor maybe that's an idea I'll yeah it, look look for, if you search for field monitor and lilyput is the brand that i've got i've got a couple of them actually uh but lilyput okay. field monitors are and there's a, there's a few others but those are the ones that uh that i use okay i will uh write that down now just okay let's talk about your goals for the take one tech mm-hmm. do you have one what's what's uh, the grand plan yeah so it's 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 the take one tech off youtube is kind of the, the the sort of business side of it um so at the moment i mean i launched uh three courses last year uh so one okay. of them was the ecam masterclass the zoom masterclass and the uh, rocaster masterclass i've just launched the stream deck masterclass um and then i've got a couple of beginners guides in there as well um, but I was I kind of pivoted to well not not totally pivoted but I introduced a a subscription model to my online uh, courses uh, to really give people a whole ecosystem of, of courses not just individual standalone things uh, and also yeah. other learning resources so I created the Take One Tech Academy in uh, April this year it's actually launched um, and okay. so that's basically a way for people to have access to all of the courses that are online but then also other resources like monthly workshops. 
uh, weekly Q and A's and stuff like that, so that uh, people who want to take the tech to uh, you know another level uh, and you know, elevate their online presence, whether it is in content, uh, but actually typically the people that I'm uh, working with or the people that come into the uh, the academy are people who are using this for business. So uh, maybe they're using Ecamm Live for all of the the kind of online meeting stuff as well as creating content. Um, so at the moment that surprises, that surprises me a little bit what the, the the so this is the other thing about um you know when you start out you might have an idea of who you're talking to or you know who you're aiming at when yeah. i my, my very first video on youtube was a, my f very first live stream as well so i didn't have any content i just went live and i was going yeah. live every every week i did a, a weekly live stream and then there was sort of five pre-recorded videos why, why um, did you do that first that first live why was that did you say yeah um the it was kind of a, a i suppose baptism of fire is the word is it <laughs> uh, right. but it was just to get over that thing of um you know doing a live stream on youtube um and uh there was nobody watching obviously because i had zero subscribers and it yeah. was just it was just me uh but then that then gave me a bit of comfort that you know oh it's not like i'm going to be doing but did it you have a plan me. though did you were you trying to achieve something and like it was the first step yeah, with the live stream, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was there was a there was a topic. Every live stream has a topic, so it was just kind of like another video, but it was just live. I do I do a live stream every week on YouTube, um, and they all yeah. have like a specific topic, um, and because I wanted to I wanted to practice that that aspect of it as well, so not just purely um, you know pre recorded stuff. Even though the pre recorded stuff is live to tape, that's still very yeah. different than you know doing it live, and and having to interact with people and take questions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, obviously no questions in that one there was just me <laughs> nobody listening so that was that was actually a really weird thing though that first live stream of just staring into the camera pressing go and technically yeah. you're broadcasting to the whole world but you're not you know nobody's watching so <laughs> yeah. it was kind of a weird thing and it felt well uh like really kind of awkward and then it was only after you know all the second week then i got a few people watching and then it sort of grew from there and it's yeah. weird like that your audience reveals itself to you um, and I was going through for the first hundred videos or it probably uh, it was it was certainly towards the end of that first year, just before I, I reached that kind of monetization uh, thing that I had a bit of this dawning realization, which is um, there is the obviously the audience of viewers, there are people who are watching and there's people who are going to come in and be casual viewers who are just um, they want to know how to do something on a stream deck. They've done a search for it. They found my video. They've watched the video. They've got what they yeah. wanted and then they're out. That's it. They, you know, it's, it's, it's there and it's information that's helpful. Um, then there are people who are, who become kind of, you know, fans that they want to, they watch every video and they, you know, get in touch with you and reach out and, uh, you build that sort of connection with them or they turn up to all the, li the, the live streams and things like that. So you get that sort of community aspect. Um, yeah. But then there's the other aspect of this, which is building a business out of it and using this as basically inbound marketing for that other business. Um, and mm. part of the way that I was monetizing before starting the, uh, well, before technically being monetized on YouTube was offering consultation calls. So if people see stuff that I've covered and want some one-to-one -one help, um, then I was offering consultation calls. And it was this realization of, well, who is it who's actually booking those calls? Never mind yeah. who's like in the chat and who's watching all those. And I'm happy to be serving all those people as well and making the content to help everybody. But who is it ultimately who is booking me to pay for my time? And that was yeah. a very clear dem demographic. It was uh, either solo entrepreneurs or maybe small company uh, you know, leaders that wanted to understand how to use this tech in their business. Um, and that is kind of like my core demographic of the people who have ultimately then gone on to join the take one tech academy or do my uh, it, certainly because that that provides this sort of holistic uh view of ev everything that i'm covering in more yeah. depth it's all you know entrepreneurs people wanting to uh to use this stuff and harness it for their business um it's, it's, it's interesting alec because a lot of people when they talk about monetization in the in the creative economy there's two things one it kind of seems like it's a bit of a dirty word and people some reason find it weird that you know people like yourself and me want to monetize and and, and need to right we've got bills <laughs> to pay and yeah families to feed and the rest of it but then also there's a lot of people who think that the only way to make money on youtube is via adsense or and actually i think you said it earlier on like you, you were making money before you were even monetized yeah uh, so and, adsense uh, is probably um at the last count, it was like 3.5% of revenue. So it's like, it's Wowzers. a fraction of it. 
really from yeah and and i think people put this too much focus on monetization you know reaching that monetization level um mm. maybe they feel it's you know out of reach because it's taken them a while to get there but like i say you can be monetized way before that um i mean the very first the very first revenue i guess that take one tech generated was i set up a buy me a coffee account so buy me a coffee is this thing where you know yeah. you can you can post it and it's not like um patreon where like patreon people are people are committing to a monthly subscription whereas buy me yeah. a coffee is they it's like because you know it's just if you've liked this content yeah, yeah. you can buy me a coffee it's like five dollars or whatever it is um yeah. and so people can go and make one-off payments and so that was actually how i first started doing my consultations on take one tech was uh there was the buy me a coffee thing offers one-off payments but then also subscriptions but then also you can offer products like a consultation you can link it all in with calendly uh, so that people can book through that so actually when i first started that's how i was booking my having people book my consultations and and the i think that you should sort of plan for all of this stuff right from the outset you know don't wait until you get to a certain level before doing it i had set up yeah. all of that stuff in the month before I started my channel and did that first live stream, um, the, you know, I had the idea and everything a month before. I gave myself a month to put all of those different parts in place. And you, and you were still working a full-time job at this point? Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what uh, were you doing prior to this? Uh, so I've, I've been involved in a, a number of different businesses, but that was uh, basically algorithmic trading, and we were developing an algorithmic trading platform. Um, and okay. so the, the course content that I was creating was for you know d educating people on how to use that. Um, but then okay. I was also a partner in a, a social media marketing and advertising company. And that's that's not actually my background, but I was kind of like the uh, the systems and processes guy. And so we came yeah. up with a system that was basically distilling down what we were doing for other people. And so we wanted to make a course for people who didn't want to go to an external agency. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we created this whole thing and I wrote a book about it. And that was, you know, another thing that I was looking to create course content around. So all of those things were my main focus. And uh, I still do have other things that I'm focused on. I'm not like totally 100% on this at the moment, but uh, it's it's certainly more like 90% of my time at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's funny, the course, the, course, the course angle is kind of, <clears throat> it's quite interesting to me because you, you, there's there's lots of, I mean, when you sort of knock around in the, in the online spheres I do, you see a lot of courses for a lot of things. And they, they almost become a bit blended into one almost. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled upon one yesterday, which, so the, the short version of the story is we're, we're talking about getting a puppy. And I was thinking, right, if we're going to get a puppy, I need to, to need to know what I need to do, right? It's like, and I was explaining this to my sister. So it's like, it's like when you have a baby. So I've had a ba two babies and you come home and you know, you've got to change nappies and you know, you go mm -hmm. to your antenatal classes and you learn like, you know, my wife's breastfeeding and all this sort of stuff. And you kind of get a rough idea of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I said to my, I was chatting to my sister who's got a dog and I was like, I don't really, apart from like taking them out for walks twice a day and, and giving them food, I, I don't know how you're supposed to, to, to raise a puppy. Right. So I went down this bit of this, um, funny, so funny enough, then Facebook target, I got Facebook ads. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're not listening, obviously. And I, I stumbled upon this guy whose name escapes me now, but he had this like free course mm -hmm. on puppy uh, learning how to raise a puppy. I was like, Oh, great. I signed up for it. And this fella had, um, he was on a platform called teachable, which I'd not heard. Oh of yes. Before. Yep. And he had, I don't know, 20 different courses in there about, um, different techniques on puppy that, that stuff. I obviously don't know cause I'm not into it kind of mm -hmm. thing. I was like, oh my God, like this guy, and they weren't cheap either. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of doing the maths in my head, like how many people would do this? And I, I mean, I might get in touch with him one day, but I reckon he's making a fortune. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how the course thing gets a bit of a bad rep. <clears throat> and, but I think if you can build that ecosystem in, in courses, there's some real sort of, if you can find your niche, I think it's the key thing. Like you've done it with, with Ecamm and, and, mm -hmm. um, stream decks and the rest of it and i think if you can find that niche i think it's kind of powerful and the other thing i'll say about it is the the to make sure that you're not sort of holding back anything from the free content as well so i i there's never anything where i think like oh i'm going to keep this back for a course or for a you know if somebody phones me then i'll tell them this little gem of information 
I was yeah. talking with somebody just actually in the academy just yesterday or day, day before um, that they're like looking to create something similar and and, and asking this, you know, or how do you decide, you know, what to give away for free and what not? I, I will give exactly the same information away for free um, as I've got in the courses. <laughs> but what people have got in the course is this thing of this structured approach. So um, yeah. and somebody contacted me because I've just launched this Stream Deck course and somebody emailed me, you know, in the mailing list and just said, I just want to know, like, what is is this just a. Uh, collection of all of your other videos or what's in here that isn't in the other videos. I said, in all honesty, if you've watched every one of my Stream Deck videos, you probably yeah. have got like all of this. But what this gives you is like a really consistent uh, path to take through it all um, in <clears throat> one place with with those updates. So, um, and as long as you're sort of clear about that and make it, you know, known that, um, you know, that, that this information is freely available, but you've, you're yeah. putting this into a structure. There are people who want it and it's, it's not going to be for everyone, but you don't have to be for everyone if you're still serving them comes, in, in other ways. <clears throat> comes back to what you said, didn't it, about packaging it. And basically, yeah. so I heard some really good advice <clears throat> and it was, you know, people just want to get from A to B yeah. and you have to, you have to create a transformation. Mm -hmm. And it, it might be that, um, yes, it's all up there on other videos you've done, yeah. but People don't. People just want simplicity. They want to go right. Okay, Alec, tell me how to start without knowing anything. And yeah. then at the end of this, whether it's an hour, three hours, whatever it might be, uh -huh. I have what I want. Yeah, and that and that people... goes for coaching as well, actually. Uh, so people mm. booking consultation calls with me. Um, y you know, sometimes people will say when they go and book a call, <clears> there is a, a place to say what do you need help with. And so sometimes yeah. people will say, I've got this issue, I've got that issue, I've got this issue. And then sometimes I'll just write back and say. Uh, I've seen that you've gone and booked a call uh, and the, the, yeah. these three points. Here's the video that answers this point. Here's the video that answers that one. And here's <laughs> the one that answers that. If you want to cancel it, then let me know. But otherwise, you know, I'll look forward to meeting you or whatever. Um, and yeah. invariably, they come back saying, I've watched all those videos. I just want you to tell me how to do it with my yeah. setup and my equipment and everything. Hold like my that. hand, so, right? Th exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there is whatever you're doing, if you're doing something that is kind of instructional, um, you definitely uh, should be considering having at least giving people the option to to do that if if that's something that you know you have the time. Obviously, then you know you're in a situation there of trading time for money. So I get get that you know you don't necessarily always have the time. Uh, that's yeah. where obviously the on demand courses have a benefit because then that is technically it's it's never there's no such thing as passive income in my mind, but it's no, as passive sure. as it gets. You know, having done the hard work and the hours of slog to actually get there and make it. Uh, but then yeah. it's then a, a body of work that's sitting there that's generating revenue. So, um, but yeah, the, the people will be willing to pay for those things, and it's not for everybody. But there, there will be there will be an audience. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so what is the actual? Do you have a, a like a, a uh, an overarching goal of what you want to achieve? Uh, yeah, so I'm doing um, uh, an event in um, uh, October. So that's called the Digital Stage Revolution. And that's all a four day event, basically, again, nothing particularly new in there, but it's going to be taking people in person through all of the different sort of technology from Ecamm Stream Deck and all of that kind of thing to how to present well online. And as I say, predominantly for business folk looking to level up in meetings, uh, and so yeah. on, and, and things like that. Um, and that's kind of like the the live event thing that's going to be in, in Dallas. Um, but this year is really about putting everything in place around that. So it's, that's kind of like the, the final piece of the, the ecosystem as I've got it at the moment, um, okay. uh, to, to have all of that. So at the moment there are, uh, six courses, um, that are available on demand or, uh, sorry, it's standalone or as part of the Academy. Uh, but then by the end of the year, there'll be about 24 courses that are available sort of as under that umbrella and then the live oh, event. So the next year I'll be shifting more into doing more of those live events because uh, there are people who do want to come along and it's this thing again, you know, some people will watch it on YouTube and then want to pay for a yeah. course. Some will pay for a course and want a one-to-one -one consultation. And some people will want to come into a live event to network with other people and actually see the things in practice and be spoken to not oh, through, a, uh, through a screen. Um, so I'm looking to do those events. Uh, the first one, as I say, is in Dallas, but then doing them in other locations around the world as well. Uh, and okay. just sort of... Where the the courses you've got like at the moment are they just on your website where where can I link to for yeah yeah yes to just uh, take one tech io is where you'll find links to all the all the things <laughs> so that's okay. the kind of the root of it uh, and that links okay. to the academy which is all of the courses or the individual courses and other sort of free resources on there as well okay I will put that below let's talk about analysis and your your thoughts on it do you do you look at the you mentioned it earlier about 
performance and doing your hundred videos. Now you've got that bank of content, mm -hmm. and presumably you can see uh, trends and what have you. But do, do you do you look at analyze? Do you analyze the performance of your videos? I definitely do. Yeah, and I don't. Um, uh, I I, <laughs> I, I, do, I do analyze them. Um, I don't obsess over it. But I think okay. it's very important to analyze it because you could be missing out on uh, something. And sometimes what you think, um, let me talk to myself, sometimes what I think is working or not working might not actually be the case. And there was, uh, I mentioned about how I didn't change anything for the first 100 or 200 videos, whatever it was. Um, yeah. But then um, one of the things was my thumbnails. Now, the thumbnails on uh, videos do actually matter. And, uh, uh, you know, that's something where... Um, it's going to make the difference between someone clicking on your video or not, essentially, when they're scrolling through. There's something that makes people click on your video over somebody else's um, or just even, you know, stop to, to take a look at it. I don't I never really like my thumbnails, to be honest. So, I'm, uh, I've, uh, you know, I'm a recovering perfectionist, so I'm never actually happy with what I've done, but I'm happy with being unhappy about it now. But there came Can a point I ask where... You about thumbna Go yes. on, no, go on. Uh, so I was just going to say that, yeah, I had this consistent look to all of my thumbnails uh, for right. this first number of videos. And at some point I looked at it and I thought, do you know what? I actually think that they look terrible. Like there's a, like a yellow stripe down one side and, a, you know, the yeah. same text on the other. The reason why they all look so similar as well is because this whole thing of having a very limited time to do it, that applied to mm -hmm. the thumbnail as well. So I had got yeah. a, a, a Photoshop file with the sort of template, if you like, a load yep. of stupid YouTube faces, all of the <laughs> shot faces, <laughs> which which do work. There's a, a great tool in TubeBuddy which will tell you which of your expressions works best and gets you the highest click through rate. So I know that like the, oh, really? the shocked face gets me much more oh, clicks man. than like the the, strange, <laughs> the confused face or whatever. But TubeBuddy goes in and, and it will it will analyze your facial expression and tell you which ones work the best. Um, oh but God. there's another tool in TubeBuddy, though, where you can do split tests. Uh, so you can say, right, well, okay, I got these videos and they've got this thumbnail. I want to test yeah. this, th this video with a different thumbnail. And I kind of had this thing where I just got tired of it. And I thought that my, my, my thumbnails look terrible and I could probably do a much better job if I spent a bit of time on it. So I kind of yeah. did a bit of a redesign of the way that I was doing them. Um, and then I just ran a split test on, you know, 10 videos with this new thumbnail versus the old thumbnail. And the results really surprised me because to me, the new ones looked a lot better. They'd seem like this text popped out of them more. They just look cleaner. They just look better. Um, but when the analysis came through, because uh, it runs for, until it's statistically significant, so it runs for a period yeah. of time until it's got enough clicks on it or whatever. Um, let's say that the old one was getting a 4% uh, click-through rate. So 4% of people who saw it clicked on it. Um, yeah. But then the new one was getting uh, 3%. And, and it was that every one of the new ones, almost every one was lower, so they were getting a lower click-through rate. But you okay. might think that it's only a 1% difference, but it isn't actually a 1% no, difference. It's, it's a 33% difference. You know, for going from mm. three to four, uh, you're, you're an extra third. So basically, or, or yeah. look at it the other way, I was reducing by 25% yeah. the number of people that were clicking on it. And it's only a marginal difference. And it was something that I thought, without a shout, if I showed it to it to somebody, I'd say, which one of these do you think looks better? Well, see, that, uh, that's, the, that's the thing. Like, the, <clears throat> the whole thumbnail thing is very subjective. Yeah. Um, incidentally, I think, uh, I, I'm sure I read somewhere yesterday or the day before that YouTube are now introducing thumbnail testing as part of YouTube. They, they are, yeah. yeah. So it's been yeah. in TubeBuddy for a while, but they're now introducing it themselves. So you can do these tests. But, I mean, it's, it really does give you an insight into, um, yeah, what, what's working and what isn't. So it's definitely Have worth testing. Have you tested testing. it again? I'm 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 constantly trying out things, so I'll go through and make just another thumbnail for something and see. My thumbnails now though aren't actually all exactly the same. So before they were all right. the same except just changing the text, and that become that's because of that that whole time thing. Now I spend yeah. a bit more time on them, and so they're more kind of. Uh, I guess they're all kind of similar style, but a little bit more individual. I I I obviously read and watch the same stuff as you, and it's like oh. Thumbnails are the most important thing in the world. And I always think to myself, is it really like, you know, you read these things about how Mr. B spends 10 grand on the, every thumbnail he does. Yeah. And you think to yourself, there must be like this kind of point where. Diminishing like, returns. The pre diminishing returns. Yeah. Where it's yeah. like, okay, you could change yours from A to B and you see that you get that from 3 yeah. to 4%. But then, like, you know, I mean, I've watched lots of videos about, you know, creating the best thumbnails. 
and they go to town and you think, you know, is that shading around <laughs> the person's head? Is that yeah. really going to make much difference? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. If, I mean, maybe, I don't know if anyone's ever done such a big enough test to, to really, uh-huh. to, to, to understand it, but it's, it's an interesting world, the whole thumbnail thing and how, yeah. I mean, to be honest, the, the, new, the newer style of thumbnails that I do, which when I say newer style, I mean the ones where I'm just basically creating each one. And there is, if you put all of my thumbnails together now, you may still think, like the most recent ones that I've done, you may still think yeah. that they're by the same person kind of thing, but um, they, they haven't got a really rigid structure like they had before. Um, and right. so that thing, when, I, when it came to, right, well, all of my thumbnails are now going to look like this, whereas before they looked like that, that's when I was really on to like the split testing to find out, does that actually work better? And then when it didn't, I was like, okay, then what, well, I better change it then. Because <laughs> otherwise, every single thumbnail has is, is, is got this, this potential issue. Um, yeah. I don't actually tend to do as, as much testing on individual thumbnails. Um, but if you have got a video that is performing really well, um, and by the way, this, the, you mentioned earlier about, you know, when starting out and the, the views might be really low and it might be a bit demoralizing sometimes when you've got low number of views. But the thing about yeah. it is over time, you're building up this, um, the, this body of work. And then sometimes, yeah. like for no reason, seemingly whatsoever, a video will just take off. Like I've had, I think, around 700,000 views overall on all of my videos, like the total number. Yeah. Um, but I've got one video that's got like 45, 50,000 of those views. So it's like out of 400 videos, one video has got, you know, six or 7% of the, all of the views. And it was one about wow. um, why profiles are better on Stream Deck than using folders for organizing it or whatever. But that video was just that's, that's quite a niche video as well, right? That's not even like a... Yeah. And, the, and it, yeah. the title of it was something like, I was wrong about profiles or something. And so <laughs> that was, the, that was the, on the thumbnail. But that video was just like flatlining for... Uh, 120 days and then just suddenly the you know on the analytics it just takes a turn and it starts heading up and it's just being consistently going up and month on month that is like one of the top one or two videos on my channel consistently um so that thing of um posting at a certain time and being consistent with you know your schedule and when you're posting i get that that is good to get into a habit and being be consistent yeah. but the majority of people aren't sitting and waiting on like a video at a certain time and like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> you know, mm. most of the people that are watching the video are watching on, you know, after the fact at some point. And especially, you know, the number of views I've had on that video, you know, only about I don't know thirty people watched it the day that I posted it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't tend to get too hung up on that either. But either, but yeah, the analytics though is definitely is definitely worth watching. The other thing that I uh, I looked at on the analytics was. Uh, the retention in videos. So if you're watching, like okay. you can see the retention for, you've got this video, how much of it do actually people watch before they switch off? Yeah. And I used to, in all of my early videos, I had this like little title sequence. So I'd come in, I'd do a hook on the video, like the, the start saying, oh, in this video, we're going to talk about X, Y, and Z. And then there'd be yeah. this little animated take one tech thing at the beginning. Um, and then it would go into the actual content. And then at some point it was like, well, who is actually tuning into my video to watch my little vanity yeah. uh, thing no, at the start? No one cares, of it? do they? Yeah. So it's it's just actually getting in the way of the content. And I was seeing that like that is when people would turn off. People would watch a little bit, and then they were just like, Meh, I'm getting I'm getting out of this now. <laughs> well, there's yeah. this little animation going on. Um, and in fact, in those um, the videos that were like the higher performing ones, I've gone back into YouTube Studio, and you can actually edit the video after the fact. Um, and that's yeah. the, the only real editing I've done is go back into some of those ones that are high performing videos uh, and just cut out that bit in the middle that or at the very beginning that nobody's interested in. Um, the other thing that I used to do at the beginning, um, I mean, at the beginning of my my <laughs> starting on YouTube was, uh, you know, you can put the little things up in the corner like of your, your thing to say, oh, link to another video. Uh, yeah. And you'll see people pointing up to the corner saying, oh, check out this other video or whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was trying to squeeze in as many of those as possible, thinking that. Um, oh, I'm just going to be I'm going to be linking to all of my other content. But all that does is it potentially just takes people out of the very thing that they're watching, and then YouTube's getting this single signal that you know the people aren't watching this whole thing. So yeah. Um, but what you can use those for strategically is um, if you find that there's a particular point in a video where there is like some massive drop off, and I, again, I don't do this with like a video that's got a hundred views, but if there's one that's like up into the tens of thousands of views. Um, yeah. And then there's a, a specific point in the video where you just watch the analytics and then there's this like drop off um, sticking something up in the, the top corner of that video that is relevant to then at least give those other people like an out. If there's people bailing yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, it's, that like point. A, it's like an alternative to exit, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, an interesting uh, insight. 
but you you can totally go overboard with with analytics and i certainly i compare myself to myself but i never compare myself to other people's analytics because it's all no. it's all relative isn't it at the end of the day yeah it's uh it's funny you saw about that that bit at the beginning because interestingly so i've just started putting my podcast up on youtube right and i have that at the beginning it'll have a the the thumbnail with the guest name the little mm -hmm. theme tune i was just like oh and I, I was watching a video yesterday um and they were saying that viewers i most viewers are looking for a reason to click out rather mm -hmm. than looking for a reason to stay right and i can't remember it's, it's got a name it's something like uh something sting or something is having these things at the beginning right and they're like just don't have it just get straight on with the content no one yes cares. yes uh -huh. and i was like oh okay um so weirdly last week is the last one that's going to have that little bit of rubbish at the right. beginning and i'm gonna I'm, and as of uh next week's episode is all it's all just gonna be straight into the content because uh -huh. yeah it is a vanity the, the, the thing, other one, right? You think, you think, oh, I want to be like the BBC and I want to have, you know, this like that's intro it. tune. and want to give it some professional look to it or something. But yeah, yeah, it's, exactly, uh, yeah. And, and the, the the ironic thing as well is, uh, well, I'll speak for myself. <laughs> you know, what I did was hardly, you know, up to sort of, uh, you know, professional standards, really. It's not like some, mm. you know, so it's, uh, but the other one that's similar to that as well is that I find that everyone just does because everyone else does it and it's just sort of self-perpetuating is specifically with live streams. People will have a countdown to the live stream. So yep. when they go live, then there's like this three minute or five minute or 10 minute countdown. And so it says, you know, stream starting soon. They're literally on the screen, <laughs> you know, maybe in a little window or something. And there's a countdown <laughs> counting down like from three minutes to, to one minute or whatever, maybe some music playing. And, and I did that from the start because that's what everyone else was doing. And then it just feels yeah. like, well, I'm sitting here, I'm ready to go, but I'm just sitting here like waiting for who it's like, it's, it just seems crazy. Yeah. Um, but then the thing about that is if people are coming to your live stream at a particular time and they're having the courtesy to turn up on time, then you're then just keeping those people waiting for three minutes. Yeah. But it also kills the replay as well, because then people see a thumbnail for a video, which might say stream three months ago or whatever. And then they, they start to play it and it's kind of like, yeah. all right, now we've got to sit through this, have we? So they've either got to fast forward it, you know, to get through to the bit, you know, the where it's starting or not and then the other thing is like starting a live stream and like right let me just say hello to the people who have just rolled in in the chat and like going through saying hello to everybody yeah. like those are the only people that matter kind of thing um so what i do with my live streams now is first of all there's no intro i just do it as if it's a, an actual video um yeah. but then i tend to do the content and then check in with the chat more at the end um because then it's like if somebody's coming in and watching in the the second highest video on my channel is actually a live stream and it only ha that only started happening where I'd get high replay views after I dropped all of that stuff at the beginning, because nobody wants to watch that for a recorded video. <laughs> no, they don't. Well, so I was going to ask you about live stream. I'm glad you brought it up because we kind of skipped through it a little bit. But <clears throat> I'm very interested in the whole live stream thought process. Mm -hmm. Why why do a live stream over just doing it as a video? How does it work once you've done the live stream? And you, you said about the replays, because I think I, I spoke to somebody else and they, they said something about how it's on a different tab and actually people might not necessarily see it as a video. So, what, so what's, what's, what's the thought process? Like, why, why do a live stream? So in the beginning, I did the live stream as a way to kind of build community or build, uh, you know, that that connection with the audience. Because when you're just okay. doing videos, there's the videos and then people are seeing your videos. But when you're on a live stream, people can actually ask you questions and you can have that right. that closer connection. And that was always okay. kind of in support of me creating the videos. And when I was doing the, the channel, uh, the, the sorry, the challenge, the 100 videos <clears> thing, <throat> I actually treated the live stream as kind of like a check in. Uh, so it was kind of okay. like my weekly update. Here's the progress because it was like documenting what I was doing as part of this challenge. So every every week at the beginning of the live stream, I'd always say, yeah, this is what's happened this week. This is how much the channel's grown and all of that kind of stuff. So it was it was a kind of like a an ongoing document. But then, you know, to have that interaction. But it was also for me to actually know who is is there and who is watching, because although you get comments, you don't get the same kind of thing as if you are literally live and there's people dropping comments and you're putting them up on the screen they're asking questions and you're answering questions you don't get that right. that same thing in uh, in just pure video comments um in terms of the actual technicalities of doing it and, and 
By the way, the reason I do it now is because I'm doing a lot of things that are Q and A's. I do want to have that interaction with people. So like I've done okay. one just recently on, you know, some of the new road products. And so it was about, you know, people giving them the opportunity to come and ask questions um, and having that back and forth as opposed to me just telling me, to, me just telling folks what I think that you know, they need to okay. know or that, you know, that I should include. Um, yeah, just being open to questions. And uh, and it was, as well for me, it's just a, you know, more of a practice thing because of, of, of practicing that process of doing stuff live and dealing with issues as they arrive, as arise, arise I suppose, yeah. as well. Um, but from a technical perspective, it does technically sit on a, uh, a different tab in YouTube Studio. Um, when you go to somebody's homepage or somebody's uh, channel page, I should say, um, then yeah. there is a space specifically for videos versus lives, but they can yeah. still be included in the playlist that you curate that you have on your front of your channel page. Um, and they also do get served to people just as a regular video does as well. Do they? That was going to be my question, actually. Yeah. yeah. So the only difference is that whereas another video might say, you know, posted whenever, in fact, they don't usually put the dates on, but on a, on a live stream, it will say streamed a month ago or a year ago. And I think that there's, and I, I know from my point of view, if I'm, if I'm searching for something and I see a video versus a live stream, I do tend to favor a recorded video because I yeah. expect that that is going to be a more of a polished thing and concise, whereas a live stream could be a lot of chatting back and forth and, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. potentially. Um, so I know that people do probably just subconsciously favor a recorded video. The other thing is when you see something was streamed like a month ago, you might have that feeling that, well, I've already missed the boat on it. It's old news sort yeah, of thing because yeah, yeah. it's got a date on it. Um, <laughs> but certainly since I changed my approach to stuff, um, I did find that my, um, uh, my, my live streams were getting that, that sort of replay value that, uh, that they weren't doing before when I was doing three minute countdowns and <laughs> checking in with the, yeah, the chat yeah, yeah. from the start. Presumably, when you do the live, you can still um, give it a, a, a keyword rich title and description. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You've got all that same, yeah. exactly the same as for a, a regular video. And you can do that in okay. advance and you can just go back and edit it after the fact as well. So you can, you've got all the same information. It's just that it's recorded live to YouTube as opposed to uploaded. Okay, fine. I've got one quick question before we move on to the next main question. You said something in that, in that little monologue that kind of made me curious. How much did you grow? from day zero to day 100? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I, do you know what? I can't just remember off, uh, offhand. Um, but I mean, it was from, it was from zero to a thousand from the 15th of May till the end of the year. So that's seven and a half months. I can't just remember what figure I was on uh, at, okay. at day 100, actually. But you hit a thousand <laughs> subs in seven, seven, seven and, and months. a half months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's pretty cool. Tell me what you think is the best way to stand out from the crowd when creating content. Um, I I'm, I'm not sure about this one because it sort of implies that there's uh, a load of people and you're all kind of like fighting for the same audience, if you like. And so you've got to do okay. something to, to, to stand out from them. Um, and although apart from the thing about, you know, we've just talked about thumbnails and that is, that that is that, exactly yeah. what you are doing. I mean, if you're scrolling down, that is the one thing that you can do to stand out from the crowd is have something that's going to be like scroll stopping, basically, that if someone's browsing on the phone or whatever, they'll hit your thing over someone else's. Um, yeah. You know, thumbnail and title is kind of what you can do. But then once people get into your, your content, um, I think it's about it, it just comes down to not standing out from the crowd necessarily, but just being being authentic and being yourself and knowing that. There was, there's going to be people who will resonate with your way of talking about things over someone else. There's very little yeah. that I've ever come up with that is original. Um, there's one in, video in particular that I think was really original that was my idea, and I made a video about it. Um, but the other 430, whatever, whatever it is, um, they, they're all just some stuff that I've learned from somewhere, and there's probably yeah. videos that tell you know, to how you do it. So there will just be people who resonate with you over someone else. And so I never really think about that. Like I'm trying to outperform anyone or do anything better than anyone else. I'm just, I'm always, I'm always trying to just do better than myself. The last video, basically. <laughs> okay. Just, I, I, just going back to that thumbnail thing quickly, because you just said something that made me think, does it get to a point where everyone's thumbnails are following the same trend or same thing that actually they stop standing out? And yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, the yeah, they, that does happen. But then it's a case of that's why nothing's really static. It's just a constant evolution. And, um, you know, mm. there is always there is always something else you can do. There is always something new you can try and uh, and people are always trying new new stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, there's there's like one theme that 
I've, uh, I've, the, the name's just slipped off my tongue there, but there was a, a guy that does a, lot of, uh, does a lot of editing. And so he had a picture of like himself, an editing timeline on the side of the thumbnail and a big red arrow saying, do this or don't do this. And it's like, it implies that there's like some secret in that video that is, yeah. you know, you, when you're editing your videos, don't do this, whatever you do kind of thing. It was big, big, big red arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it became a thing that like everyone saw that that was a really popular video that he made. <laughs> and now you'll see that all over the place, this big arrow, like change this, do this, do that. Yeah, And, and so it's yeah. kind of like, oh, what am I supposed to be doing then? <laughs> well, there's, a, there's a secret in here somewhere that yeah. I want to find out about, yeah. So those kind of like clickbaity almost type things, there are certain trends like that that will come up that someone will start doing it. But then, you know, that guy's moved on and he's now come up with another idea of a way to stand yeah. out and it's a constant thing, but I, I just, uh, I focus more on the, the content to be honest, than, 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 right. than that thing of diminishing returns, trying to get the absolute maximum number of, uh, of people. Okay. Tell me something you struggle with or find tough. Um, that is a bit of a tricky one. Um, I mean, I could say that like of late, this is going to sound ironic having done that challenge of a hundred videos, or whatever, but of late, I've, I suppose I've technically struggled with consistency, um, right. in terms of like posting. So I'd stopped doing my, a lot of regular videos, but it's not a case of, it's not a struggle like, Oh, I wish I could do it, but now I can't or something like that. It's just that other things have come in and, and taken priorities are taken yeah. a priority. So whilst I wish I was posting more consistent recorded videos on YouTube, I've just been in this position of focusing on more course content to get the that thing sorted uh you know that yeah. eco that ecosystem uh, to then get back to the recorded content so um but you i guess that was schedule say again sorry do you work to a schedule um uh, i work to a schedule in that i'm quite metic meticulous in like my sort of task management i've got task management software omnifocus that's another whole rabbit hole <laughs> but um that i use um but in terms of actual posting schedule I don't um no I have a okay. I, at the moment I don't I've just got my weekly live stream and then I post other other videos but I don't I'm not really meticulous about that as such. Okay, fine. Who on YouTube if you could shadow them for one day would you would you choose? I I'd really like actually just because he's such a cool guy and a nice guy. Uh and so it's for this reason more than anything. Uh but so, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Tom Buck. So he makes video no. about um av gear uh, uh roadcasters microphones cameras you know a very similar overlap really in terms of some of the stuff that i talk about but he okay. is um he's really meticulous he's a really nice guy um and he's really you can just tell like the attention to detail that he puts into his videos and they're all edited yeah. um so but like really well um i'd love to just spend a bit of time to see his process now i, I would never try and emulate his process because um he spends too much time for, you know he spends time editing and all the setup i'm a much more you know, i've got a different approach to him but at the same yeah. time i'd just love to see how he goes about like creating the the things that he he makes which are like i say very similar in style to mine but uh he's got a different way of going about it and yeah that's are that's, you connected with him yeah yeah we're in the we, i mean he's in the ecom community as well so um we're, we're connected that way he's in he's based in uh, uh texas or arizona but yeah Dallas, Dallas isn't far from there. Maybe, it's, uh... it's not, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, you know, it's good. Like, I'm glad you said someone I didn't know because it, invariably, when not just on this podcast, but in general, like you know, if you ask someone to to share a creator, so it's, it's often the same names that pop up. So it's kind of cool that I can now check out someone else. Tom Buck. Tom yes. Buck. Yes. Yep. Yeah. He's. Right, uh, okay. I think when I started my YouTube channel, he was on around twenty thousand subscribers, something like that. And then he passed okay. 100,000 earlier uh, this, or just at the end of last year. I think he's on about 125 now. So he's been on this sort of trajectory <laughs> going like, you know, the exponential okay. thing. So, um, yeah. Okay, fine. I'll, uh, I'll check him out and I'll, I will link to him below for anyone who wants to uh, take a look. Let's, um, let's talk about advice for aspiring YouTubers. If someone said they wanted to create a channel, what, what is it you'd tell them? Um, I guess put, have a have a starting plan in place, like in terms of what you're looking to achieve about it, but also set reasonable expectations. I think people do expect the growth to come potentially quicker than it does. Um, okay. So, you know, be mindful of that. But even if the growth initially is slower, having a plan of where it's going to go afterwards. So like I said, I've, you know, I put systems in place for things like 
you know, people <laughs> being able to monetize it before monetization um, yeah. and having those things kind of in place from the outset, I think is uh, is worth spending the time doing and, and, and getting that structure in like right from the beginning. Um, okay. Did you have a growth plan? It, it, I did, but it's kind of pivoted. So, you know, that's the other thing is like when you've got a plan is is always be open to new opportunities when they come. So, uh, yeah. you know, I did feel that like, oh, yeah, there would be something that would come out of it. But I, I couldn't I couldn't, you know, put a, a thing on. I never I never set subscriber numbers as goals either, because a goal, you're not in, you need to be in control of a goal. Uh, yeah. You know, or, you know, if, if you're aiming for something. Um, so the, the actual numbers never factored into that, but you know, things like the number of videos or, uh, you know, whatever it is, something that is actually tangible that you're in control of is, are the only things really ultimately that you can, that you can control. So it's funny that I'm not in content creation, but that's, that's advice I give a lot uh to people about don't set your goals as something that's not in your control. Yeah. It's that whole thing. Exactly, that... this, exactly the same thing. Like, just say, like, I'm going to put out 100 videos over this time frame and know that you have total control over that as yeah. opposed to what the results are at the end. Uh-huh. It, yeah. it comes back to the, the what the smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, all, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Good advice. Alec, if we spoke again in 12 months and you said to me, do you know what, Chris, it's been a really, really good year for, for me and my channel and the ecosystem, what would have happened? I think it would be getting all of the, getting all the courses out that I've, uh, that I've got in the pipeline. Um, and then obviously the, you know, getting back to the more consistent uh, posting of videos. And I'd, ideally, when I've got all of the, the recorded course content out, I'd like to get back to doing at least two or three recorded videos a week in it, uh, as okay. well as the... Uh, uh, the live stream and actually being in a consistent flow with that. So, uh, like I say, this, this actual year, the rest of this year, calendar year, the year I would like to have uh, done the core stuff. So then within a year from now, we'd be six months into next year. And, uh, yeah, it'd be nice to be back into that sort of rhythm, I think with it. Are there, are there any other tools or softwares or products you've kind of got half an eye on that you're going to add into your Ecamm live road Elgato, um, I like mix I'm, to be honest with you i'm kind of there there is this thing gas gear acquisition syndrome which is there's uh, there's like always some piece of gear that you can buy to fix whatever problem it that is you've got and i was speaking to someone just yesterday who said that like this feels like never ending because what happens is you've got your computer then you get like a, a stream deck and then you get to another stream deck or you get a roadcaster and then suddenly you've run out of ports on your computer so then you get a, yeah. a, a dock and then you decide to add in a teleprompter and another monitor, and then you've run out of other ports. And it seems like there's always something, and you, you improve the lighting. But really, I'm kind of happy with my setup now, to be honest. There's a few little but things do, I, I would tweak, but um, but do you look at that on a on a on? So your setup is what it is, and that's what it, that, mm. obviously that's fueled a lot of videos for you. Yep. Is there anything you're thinking right in order to start creating two or three videos a week? I I almost need to find more things to talk about. Not really, no. I'm, I mean, I talk about the things that I use for what I do, and actually, what I do is is it's more about me being productive on my on my Mac, talking about the way that I use these yeah. things into, um, uh, yeah, like into Zoom, into Teams, all that kind of stuff to present on online. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's really talking about those um th those tools, and there's always new things to talk about. I don't think I'd ever. <laughs> I don't think I'd run out of stuff in a, in a, in a hurry about it. I mean, I've got a running list of, of videos and there's like over 200 videos on the list that I've got to just make. So, um, and, and there's, there's, there's more being added on than I'm, I'm making, uh, when okay. it just comes from a question or something. So I don't think I'll, I, I don't feel like I'm not a tech channel. That's always looking for, oh, I've got to do the next unboxing. I don't tend to do unboxing yeah, yeah. type videos. So I, I don't need to continually fuel it that way. Okay. I guess these softwares and products, like you said, they update so regularly. There's always something new to talk about. Yeah. Right? Okay. Alec, I'm going to save you from any more questions because I could pick your brains and I, I might actually look at one of your courses because I think it might come in handy for how I forward this podcast. But I want to thank you for taking the time today. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks um, so much for having me. It's, it's been incredibly insightful. And if we, if nothing else comes from this and no one watches it and no one listens to it, but I get the hang of keyboard, uh, keyboard maestro, I will consider it a huge success. So, and I think that, you know, when I, when I start this podcast, one of the things I wanted was ultimately, if I found it interesting, I kind of figured that someone else would, 
Um, so I think people will. I think it's it's been really, really positive. So I want to thank you for your time this, today. It's been really oh, good. Well, thank, like I say, thanks for having me. It's been uh, been a pleasure chatting and geeking out about this stuff. <laughs> if um if if anyone's listening or watching and they want to come and say hi or pick your brains or check out stuff, is there anywhere else apart from um, obviously your YouTube channel and takeonetech.io, which I will link to everything below is there anywhere else that's, that's a good avenue for them to go to that's the, that's the best place really they can find everything from there in any case and uh, youtube is my main platform there for content yeah. creation and uh, the, the website's got everything else linked from there so it's uh, that's the best place okay go and check it out everybody alec johnson a very very big thank you thanks so much <laughs>